Aaron, um, thanks for joining me. I'm, it's a real pleasure to get the chance to, to speak to you. Um, for folks who are not aware of you, you're an acrobatics coach, um, you know, kind of in the this broad category that exists now of soft acrobatics. And uh, you have uh, online courses. Do you do um, online personal training as well? I do online coaching as well. Yeah, pretty much everything around learning acrobatics without a person standing next to you. That's what I currently focus on. And then you're uh, a sports science student uh, as well. Um, and you're based out of Germany? Exactly. I'm currently in Frankfurt, Germany. Super fortunate that the sports science program here is really picking up. I remember back when I first enrolled for philosophy, uh, that sports science department didn't exist in the same way. And uh, yeah, I'm fully into research mode and at the same time, um, really sort of comparing what I've been doing all these years and coaching people and of course updating some of my old beliefs and it's just absolutely wonderful the kind of um, uh, I would say self-proclaimed myth busting that can occur inside my own brain where I'm like wow I just had the wrong beliefs about how all this motor learning stuff works for so long so it's a pure joy it's like I feel like I'm uh, let loose into the world of parkour once over only that now 15 years later uh, the world of science is equivalent to the world of parkour. So mm. I'm, I'm feeling like, uh, yeah, just super happy. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I think you reached out to me last year when I was in Germany to like train and my probably seen your, your, some of your movement for a while then, but I think it was after that, that I started noticing that you're really bringing a very strong kind of understanding of motor learning. Um, some of the same areas of constraints led approach and, external cues and the things that that I've worked with and highlighted here on the podcast, but specifically in the acrobatic space. So that's, you know, definitely a big reason why I wanted to, to have you on. I think it was very interesting. The, the way you've systemized and thought about the approach to the learning of basic acrobatics for adults is very unique. And um, I really enjoyed your your podcast with Joseph Bartz. And uh, I got a chance to, to review some of your programs, some of your writing, um, in preparation for this and it's, it's very impressive work so uh let's start with the question what in the world is soft acrobatics wonderful question as always um soft acrobatics i, I gotta admit is something that i more stumbled upon um mm -hmm. rather than deliberately um deliberately coined and it is essentially this world of movers who already exist out there, one of the really early ones, Ido Portal, mm -hmm. who move in a way that is just so enchanting when they fluidly get from one pose into the next. It's not quite yoga, it's not quite capoeira, there's no opponent, it's not breaking b-boying because there's no music going, but they move so incredibly beautifully that I just want to do it. That's what I later found out I would just classify as, um, as soft acrobatics. Mm -hmm. and. Now that I've been teaching it for a while, of course, I want to give it a bit of a choppier summary, which is an acrobatic practice that is for you, the adult, to keep for the long run. So it's not focused on some external performance goals. It's not about winning any medals, any prizes. It's not about um, even, uh, I, I don't know, it's essentially not about comparing yourself to anyone, but it's about celebrating this relationship between you your mind, whatever that is, your body, and all the fears around moving that come up. And sort of all of that jumbled up into a practice that we can now be completely in charge of. That's what I would call soft acrobatics. Mm -hmm. um, I also come from a parkour background. Mm -hmm. So for me, well, originally I played soccer for 10 years. Um, lots of variability in there, lots of just follow the ball, just do the thing that you want to do. But then when I found parkour, I found actually for some reason, maybe I was maturing, I'm enjoying this part more. I can hear my thoughts better. I can feel my body better when I'm not completely out there in the open and I'm just trying to chase after a ball, trying to score. So this sort of internal process that parkour gave me, I later wanted to apply into my, well, even more maturing adult life where I don't have to go out to find a spot or I don't have to uh, commit three hours to practice if I want to see my bot uh, buddies. I want to have a fun practice in a 10 minute break in between writing articles. And for me, the sort of where that all led to is just soft acrobatics, a practice you can do anywhere that you can, you just need a floor of, um, and you're, it doesn't matter how old you are. There is a way for you to learn these acrobatic elements, which at first I had to teach myself a lot of, had to learn a lot of, 
and now I'm hoping to pass on some of that. Maybe even uh, we can do that auditively <laughs> to some of the listeners. <laughs> Auditorially, I think. <laughs> I think the first time I heard the term soft acrobatics was eight or more years ago, and it was from Edo, right? So I'm not sure if that's kind of where that term starts to sort of explode into the community in, in your understanding. But I, I remember that. And, you know, I think the way that he was framing it is that a lot of traditional acrobatic practices that are oriented towards performance and that are really for children, basically, um, they don't really have much concern for their sustainability to the body. Mm -hmm. Interesting. An analogy that just pops up into my mind is it's kind of like uh, what happened with modern dance where you had yeah. performance dance and then as you know ballet was just not something that a body could really handle over a very long period of yeah. time and so you had this this movement to say well how how does a how is a body actually organized to move healthfully and how could we adapt yeah. dance such that it is um something that we can do sustainably and maintain performance over a much longer period of time yeah. and i think that that's the same same basic principle and you know, if you look back through through Ido's background before soft acrobatics, there was Floreo art, right? Where he took mm -hmm. the the sort of ground acrobatic and strength elements of capoeira and mm -hmm. acrobatic elements of capoeira, and he turned that he sort of focused on that as an art independently of the actual capoeira game. And then of mm -hmm. course, over time we have the the interaction of that with um, contemporary dance, with uh, Russian Sistema, or Russian martial arts mm. has a full ground acrobatics program. Um, we have the uh, um, tricking, right? The whole development mm. of tricking as a, uh, as a as an independent art from martial arts and gymnastics. And mm. so now I see yourself, I see Tom Wexler, I see uh, mm. Neil Tisner, who are all mm. in this realm where it's it's not quite, it's not exactly the same as the floreo or groundwork that we're seeing in movement culture. Mm. And it has a slightly different flavor. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious kind of how you, how you see like the community of people who've picked up that idea of soft acrobatics and, and what it's, what it's why is actually would be a good way to, to, to think about it. Oh. Uh. What it's why is is a question that I love. I've pondered a lot about. Seeing everyone else doing what they're doing, I can't help but call it something that stems out of a deep interest for moving. And that deep interest, I think, everyone interprets slightly differently. And that's a beauty. Whatever becomes out of the field of soft acrobatics, that I would love if that can be sustained. That it's not a single syllabus that it's not a single traditional form. That's, I think, what the b-boying world originally did really well, because they're good at stealing elements mm -hmm. from all the other uh, existing practices and claiming them, making them theirs, then elevating the game, uh, taking a, a flare from gymnastics, turning it into the air flare to the point where the gymnasts then took the air flare back yeah, and yeah. they stole something from breaking. And I love that exchange element. I think the the opportunity that any new art form has that comes onto the field is it decides what the entry point is for people who first come to the art. Mm -hmm. And that's something where I would say a culture like breaking and b-boying, similar to a culture like capoeira or even the circus arts, even though there I see there's a lot of development in the recent years, they're relatively rigid. Like you'll find, for example, if you come to um, uh, a b-boy jam, often they're open, often you don't pay entry, sometimes there is a teacher, but that's more dance classes. What you'll find is that if you don't wear the proper outfit, you start to feel a little bit awkward. Mm -hmm. If you don't habitually already listen to the kind of music that they listen to, like proper breakbeats and you get a good feeling for the downbeat and the upbeat, then you can start to feel lost a little bit easily, which makes it especially difficult for adults. I think I'm 31 now. I think when I go into a, a new unfamiliar environment, definitely when I was 20, I cared a little bit less. I mean, you know, I also do some internal work, but I'm starting to be a bit more aware of what I do in public. 
like which dirt I'm rubbing my shirt into. Mm -hmm. I'm becoming a bit more aware. So the same thing is true for when I enter an entirely new culture and I don't quite know what's going on. Like if I'm doing capoeira, do I have to sing? What if I don't want to sing? But there's a move that I find really cool. So this is the big opportunity that I see soft acrobatics has saying, what if we make this a practice about acrobatics that we can do in a soft way as adults? What would be the best possible paths of entry, the best entry points? And what my work or what I see my work as to a large extent is lowering the barrier of entry because the skill ceiling is infinitely high. Everyone can see who follows an amazing acrobat. Like we're not worried about how high we can go. I'm more worried about how can I make the, the first couple of steps so easy that anyone who has felt like me being a kid watching Jackie Chan growing up was like, ah, that was so cool. I wish I could do that actually has a systematic um, science informed way of getting going. And science informed way just for me means uh, relatively reliably leads to good results for the largest amount of people based on principles that then can be adjusted for the individual again. Yeah. Um, hmm. I'm trying to pick up on what, what you, what you said there is, it's difficult to paraphrase the, the why that, that came out of that. Um, I, I suppose what you're saying is your why is really about the ease of entry and the sense that a lot of these acrobatic potentials are stored in traditional practices that have a much harder entry for the student. That if you mm. want to learn a uh, a what you call a Cossack sweep or what's called a uh, a coffee grinder in um in 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 b boy, that if you go to a b boy community. It's hard to extract that skill without sort of paying a higher upfront cost of cultural, basically, adoption. I've always thought that was interesting because, well, I guess I want to, I'm, I'm curious about a, almost a problem, problematizing that a little bit. There's a lot of vocabulary that, that happens in movement culture, right? Like a lot of movement culture actually comes from capoeira. And there's a way in which it feels like capoeira is actually quite forgotten, by the mm -hmm. movement culture. And then there's this, this aim to create a culture and to create, you know, great movers. But then a lot of the things that mm -hmm. were left behind are actually the things that create great movers, like the relationship mm. with music, mm. right? Like the, the game, right? Playing with mm. another person, right? Sense of rhythm, competition. So I find it interesting because I think that a lot of times like what we're talking about, that science-based capacity to transmit skill and meet students at the level that they are and work with them. I find the mm -hmm. couple of other communities really terrible at that, honestly. <laughs> very, mm -hmm. very low levels of understanding of, um, of pedagogical principles and often mm -hmm. not a lot of actually interest in or desire to meet the needs of average students, right? Mm. Um, but on the flip side, if you can make it through the meat grinder that is capoeira, you have this incredibly complete cultural container that informs your whole self in a much deeper way than any isolated skill does. And so there's a way in which there's something about the holisticness of these older practices that I worry gets lost when we treat it as a set of a vocabulary of movement skills only. So I'm curious how you feel about that. I can't help but notice that you speak of the container, which is essentially an enveloping thing, as a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. And I think if we're finding anything even through the sciences, then it seems to be that the diversity that we assume this there is even much greater than we ever thought. Mm -hmm. And the internet does help expose us to sort of the, the many different um, branching roots that exist that we could connect to. And in part of that, now there might be a problem where I feel really connected to um, uh, a certain cultural language or acrobatic movement, but what if I don't have my people around here? Mm -hmm. And I think for me, there is this, I would like to be able to piece apart a little bit the 
liking of a, a skill, a movement, and an essential quality that is something like physical health, and uh, put that next to something like um, a communal social life. And I wouldn't necessarily say that these are forced to overlap, because I might have certain interests when it comes to intellectual exchanges that I actually don't care about um, influencing my fellow movers with. On the flip side, I do want to have room for that. So what I find is that um, the uh, holisticness of rich traditions, for me personally, that's the only thing that I can say with certainty, has always felt limiting and too rigid. Mm. And I, I felt like I was bumping into walls quite quickly. And what I would like to, the image that I have in mind is something like that I don't get my stability from a set of walls that enclose me, but from a relatively loosely connected web. I sort of have a tensegrity structure in mind where sort of the compression elements flow, float amongst the tension elements. And the tension elements are my connections to people. The compression elements are the skills that I develop myself. And as that, I want to become that, uh, that uh, uh, skillful, skillful, skillful person enwrapped in a net of really good social connections. And yeah, I personally didn't find the one where I felt like, good enough, I can make it here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, hmm. the, the tensegrity structure versus the idea of sitting inside the walls of the practice it's an interesting it's an interesting um way of mapping it for some reason what it kicks off for me is a, is a quite different project but maybe related in a way uh one of the areas of my research and thinking is actually within philosophical and spiritual practices and love some of your conversations with john rubeki <laughs> yeah exactly well, John has recently, he, he used to talk a lot about the idea of a religion that is not a religion, um, mm. that essentially we need a, we need to rehome the sacred in our culture because, uh, mm. the loss of the sacred has been, uh, deeply, um, problematic for people, but that the traditional world religions have, they don't seem to be stable in some sense in relationship to science and that this creates, mm -hmm. you know, a conflict. Now, we don't need to dig into that. But what was interesting is he's recently switched from the idea of a religion that is not a religion to something he calls the philosophical Silk Road. And the analogy here is that within the Neoplatonist tradition and the Zen tradition, there's a set of principles that are actually broadly shareable across different religious frameworks that help us scale up wisdom and you know philosophical capacity so neoplatonism of course we you know we see in both uh christianity islam judaism and all of those and then uh um zen is is a meeting of buddhism and um and taoism but it can interact with lots of uh, different things and so he has this analogy that comes from c.s lewis that essentially this can be like a hallway and then each of the traditional religions is a um is like a uh a room right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so c.s lewis used this analogy to talk about christianity there is mere christianity which is the hallway and then each denomination is the religion so mm -hmm. in some sense we could port this analogy over and say that we can think of movement culture and areas of movement culture as like hallways within the mm -hmm. network of movement culture writ large mm -hmm. and then a practice like parkour or a practice like capoeira is like the room mm. but there's things that you only get from living in the room that you can't get from only spending your time in the hallway and so there's something interesting to me about the idea that when we get too shut in our room we miss out on a lot mm. Right. It can be too rigid. You, mm. you, you, you're, there's, there's aspects of the capoeira or the parkour community that aren't going to, you know, sort of meet all the needs of, of the developmental needs of a specific individual. Right. Mm. But having a, a base or home practice 
can be a really powerful mm-hmm. to 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 work from because of mm-hmm. something like like you mentioned having to sing right like it mm-hmm. feels very strange you go in because you want to learn to do this cool movement but you have to sing it turns out that singing is an extraordinarily powerful aspect of being a human being and you might not realize that until you are forced to do it by your capoeira teacher and then eventually yeah. you'll see that the energy that's in the hoda it exists because of the singing and the playing music and the folklore mm. and then that access to skills is actually easier because of the psychology that's created through the culture that surrounds the hoda mm. so i don't know that was a tangential uh set of ideas i'm curious what uh what occurs for you in response to that a wonderful set of ideas the first image that i had in mind is if there's a a whole array of rooms then it would be really helpful to have some guides who can connect you across mm-hmm. different pathways exactly and i think like you said the movement culture might be one of those connecting disciplines and for that very reason i think it is really helpful to have that even the movement culture label or let's just call it there's movement teachers mm-hmm. and uh, we remove the culture part of it and say mm-hmm. there's some people who really interest in the, uh, interested in the totality my difficulty with it so far has been that it seems that movement teachers tend to be people with uh, quite a couple of different interests Mm-hmm. And the question that I was asking underneath when I saw teachers like Ido, uh, I felt like there was a promise given, and that promise was something like, you learn how to move well. Mm-hmm. And the answer to that promise, unfortunately, is even though it might be more present in some practices than in other practices, it's currently very inexplicit, like David Deutsch would say. Mm-hmm. In other words, the knowledge isn't formulated. Ah, uh, I can't remember. Uh, John's 4P framework, but mm-hmm. it would be propositional knowledge, I propositional, reckon. Propositional, procedural, partic- uh, uh, perspectival, and participatory, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I reckon, like, maybe movement skill is uh, benefits from knowledge of all of those areas. Like, if I have uh, participatory knowledge, then it means something, I'm not sure if I'm uh, using John's terms properly, but it probably means that there's a way that a break dancer, a b-boy, would carry themselves that gives them a certain smoothness that might make some entries to move easier. And I'll only really know when I'm around of people who behave in a similar way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let me explain the, the four P's because it's quite interesting and it'll give us yes, please. something to, to work with. So propositions are, are words, right? It's semantic knowledge. It, you know, you, if I say... Um, you know, that we're using a, a, horizontal, a horizontal momentum strategy in a hole, that's a proposition, mm. right? Mm. Now, to feel the difference between using more um, more horizontal versus a more vertical uh, movement pattern in a makaku is a procedural mm. knowledge. It's a knowledge that lives mm. in the body, right? Mm. Now, an athlete can have the procedural aspect of being able to control that and not be able to describe or understand the principles that, that do that. They don't have the semantic mm. capacity with it. Perspectival is something like what the world looks like to you because you can do this skill. Mm-hmm. So if you can do a Kong vault, then you walk through the world and the potential for Kong vaults occurs to you. You can see them. Mm-hmm. Like you couldn't do this skill before. The affordance updating. Affordance, the affordance exists. And then participatory mm-hmm. is, is, is strange. It's actually the sense of self that's associated with you as you transform over time. And mm-hmm. this is related actually to four distinct kinds of memory that you experience. So you have semantic memory, right? So I can say to you, you know, in what year did Columbus sail the ocean, right? Mm. and that's that's semantic you also have procedural memory right um Mm -hmm. you know how to ride a bike you know how to brush your teeth you know Mm. right you know uh to put your uh your underwear on before your pants in the morning most of the time yeah (laughs) (laughs) 
And then you have uh, uh, episodic memory. You remember things that happened. That's okay. what's associated with your perspectival knowledge. And the type of memory that's associated with participatory is quite strange. It's the type of memory that lets you know that you are you. It's your sense of self. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can, you can injure your brain in such a way that you retain all of your propositional mm. knowledge. So you know who your wife is, you know, everything about her. Um, you, you know how to like do the household with her. You know, you, you, you remember all the things you remember your wedding, but you mm. don't actually remember that you are you. You're like, ah, oh, this There's is no longer a continuity living, of memory. Mm -hmm. Living all of a sudden in the life of this person, but I don't recognize that person as myself. Mm -hmm. That's participatory. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. so, so with that background, go ahead and, and, and see if that updates what you wanted to, to say there. Yeah, in, in, in some ways it makes it more complicated. I think the initial framework that I was thinking in, uh, it's, it's sufficient to say that there is inexplicit knowledge stored in a lot of culture in a lot of these different rooms in which people have already developed acrobatic skill and there's been very little effort to make it explicit and it's my or to make it propositional to turn it into propositional knowledge and it's in my understanding that most cultures don't have this interest to make the knowledge explicit to make it in such a way that it can be easily passed on and stored verbally or in uh, images and pictograms in instruction manuals and so on and from my understanding one of the few cultures that has this tradition of criticism and updating is the scientific undertaking mm -hmm. so for me it's the i'm following Karl popper and jacob bernowski in their understanding of uh, the tradition of criticism that it's about a process that is cultural, culturally enforced, that conjectures explanation or makes guesses, mm -hmm. and that doesn't stop with the guesses and say, here we are, this is the best thing, but that questions these and course corrects and error corrects them. Mm. And in very few cultures that have a long running, uh, sort of uh, a long standing, I expect, um, I experience this process of error correction. For example, one way in which I would like to correct some of the things that I perceive as errors in soft acrobatics is by simplifying naming. Mm -hmm. There's been this essentially culture of making up your own names or with taking names from other things. Like I'm not guilt free with this. Macaco is a name from Capoeira that I use just because it feels like it's seeped into the pop culture and enough people know what it is to understand. But so is cartwheel. Maybe some core principles don't need to be reinvented. But if I require someone to feel awkward if they can't say the Portuguese pronunciation of a capoeira move. Again, I'm raising boundaries for something that I don't perceive as necessary. Again, I, the origin culture, there, it's as essential as saying there needed to be um, Einstein's theory of relativity uh, or there needed to be Newton's theory of gravity before Einstein could update it. Mm -hmm. And no one would think of talking badly on Newton for coming up with a brilliant model that worked for pretty much everything on Earth as long as we're not uh, covering large enough distances. And it's that sort of, yeah, uh, exactly. The, the whole quantum realm also, like there's this current conflict, as I understand it, between uh, Einstein's theory of relativity and quantum theory and that they're essentially impossible to currently bridge at least. Mm -hmm. They have conflicting um, statements about reality, yet both of them are some of the deepest theories of knowledge that we possibly have. And no one expects both of these theories to be around forever. And that's what I, the idea of that I love. I love that there is an acrobatic model that I can develop. And if it survives the test of time, if many people learn from it well, and they learn so well that they want to pass it on, then the model did a good job. And that model could be carried on. So I'd love to see what a, like a, what an, a planet would look like in which learning acrobatics is just another choice that is as open as deciding to learn how to ride a bicycle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not an ideal, like uh, the, the bicycle with its uh, inertia is allowing us to you know, sit up there quite easily, but I would love for people to get the sense, if I, if I see something amazing, then I don't have to listen to the inner voices of the elementary school coach that says, you're never able to do this. Like, this is only for great people. You're not great. But rather I would have, 
I'd like for people to have the idea that, oh, it's learnable, it's doable. And currently, I think that's not yet the, the sense that people have when they see amazing acrobatic feats. Mm. So I think what I heard basically is that your project in some sense is to bring a, a, a more robust, portable, functional epistemology to the practice of acrobatics such that it is not only accessible through traditions that have that are often actually not that good at actually teaching the elements people are going to them for and also come with a lot of baggage that can make it much more difficult to access like be that was wonderful and concise and i wish i had said it that that beautifully <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so um i wanted to go back a step because you there was something there was a there was an i think an implicit criticism of of movement culture that I'm quite interested in and I, that I think I've answered actually, but, um, <laughs> but it, it was around this idea that there's a promise in movement culture that we will teach you to move well, but there's not actually a very sound epistemological model of what moving well means in some sort of generalized way. And my my critique of movement culture has been that to a very significant degree, what appears to drive the choices of movement training modalities is largely um, basically path dependent. It's because it just happened to be that Ido came from Capoeira and got interested in gymnastics and circus hand balancing. And so these became the trends. And then, uh, so there's a path dependency that's, that comes from the founding figures. And then there's a path dependency that comes from a selection factor in social media that um, rewards specifically memeable forms of movement, basically, without actually any real theory of why, right? Like, should you be able to do a one-arm handstand to be a good mover? <laughs> well, if you look at the best movement problem solvers in general across every type of task, almost none of them can do one-arm handstands. And if you look at people who can do one-arm handstands, they're not very good at solving many other movement problems. So the idea that this is an exemplary core skill to be aimed at in the cultivation of a generalized movement capacity um, is, from my opinion, deeply misguided. Um, and I think Ito's answer to this has been that movements themselves are in some sense unimportant, but we can extract out omega principles from the things that we do. But then you don't have to justify the movements that you use. And, and my problem with that is that actually there is uh, substantial differences in the, John would say that movement skill or generalized movement capacity is organized in a small world network fashion. There's asymmetric relationships between different movement uh, skill areas. And the example that I've given of this is um, in gymnastics. It's really easy to see this in gymnastics. Most the majority of gymnastics teaching is actually going to be done on the floor because the floor exercise donates more skills to every other exercise than any other exercise does. Mm. Reciprocally, the pommel horse has the fewest skills mm -hmm. and the, the least similar general body mechanisms to any other area in gymnastics. And not only in gymnastics, right? Like if you're a good tumbler, that will help you in a lot of things. But if you are good at the pommel horse, there's very few things that are actually going to be going to have a really direct kind of movement correlation between them. And you can see this if you look at, um, you can correlate people who win the all around in gymnastics. What, what event do they tend to be good at other than that? So pommel horse specialists do not perform well in the all around. 
-hmm. Floor specialists do. And then high bar specialists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So high bar and vault are the other two most. So the idea here is that if you, if you give yourself exactly equal time to all of these things, mm. you're not optimizing your potential to create a generalizable physical skill. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, um, so this is, th this is how I've kind of solved that problem in my mind, mm. this idea of what are the, what are the most central nodes mm -hmm. that have the most asymmetrical relationships to other mm -hmm. other skill areas so mm -hmm. um, if you had to take a high level parkour athlete and make a track and field athlete out of them or a, mm -hmm. uh, a track at, or take a track athlete and make a parkour athlete which athlete is going to actually adapt to the other sport faster and i would say the parkour athlete mm -hmm. will adapt faster. for sure mm -hmm. so that, that's a central skill node so mm -hmm. i'm curious you know what your response to it uh, that is, and if you think it solves the problem of movement culture that I thought you were pointing to, and then how you see acrobatics and its relationship to this idea of central nodes of, of generalized movement capacity. Mm. One part of it that I see is that the more complex skills just simply seem to do better. I'm guessing the nodes that you'd be selecting for is one, great complexity in the environment, and that's parkour. Then two, great complexity in the information um, or great variability in the information that's coming in. And there, a dynamical system like a soccer team is still more complex than the environment that I face as a parkour practitioner, even though the forest is yet the more complex environment that has more greater variability in affordances than the average cityscape. Then the other part of it that I'm assuming that it's of relevance is having a quality, a rhythmicality, which of course parkour has innately built in. Soccer does too, because it gives you the competitive edge if you can uh, dictate and break the rhythm more effectively. And then I'm guessing there's um, probably an element of, uh, I don't know, risk detection or body body practice, like Joseph would say, uh, a level of like, I really want to um, roughhouse with my opponent and learn how that feels so that I'm not completely um, out there in the open. I think if the task was to develop the most capable movement problem solver, then the first question that I would have is, how can we measure this? Mm -hmm. What's, how can we determine whether we now do have the person or do not have the person? And it, to me, is then a performative sport that at least I decided not to be interested in. So for me, in my current trajectory and path as a teacher, which I expect will change over time, I'm not that interested in performative elements as in we want to compare or we find out who's best by comparing one person against the other. Because then you forever have this rock, paper, scissor triangle where some people are going to specialize more in exactly the weakness of the other person. And at the end of the day, you're just playing fun games and some people make a lot of money from it too. But it, I wonder if that's the approach to answer the question, who is the best movement problem solver? Because something that's innate to movement problem solving is that the more precisely we know the movement problems the better we get at solving it but we're saying something like who's the person who's in general best at solving all problems and i personally i don't find that a rewarding endeavor because it sounds to me similar to saying how can i personally aaron who likes soft acrobatics be equally well read across all scientific domains and i would simply say i don't see relevance in that but what I would find more interesting is something like or what I think is culturally more relevant is something like well no I have to retract I wanted to say is a general syllabus that would be good for all people I for example think that the history of science is just a freaking great learning tool like if you understand what the original problems were that people were trying to solve, how they solved them, and then how that created the next series of problems, to me that's a great syllabus. I know that David Deutsch would go against that because he would just say some people are just not, not going to be freaking interested in the history of science. And regardless of what system you put them in that forces them to go through the syllabus, now you have a coercive structure which likely diminishes the creativity of that person or the joy or the fun or the interest. So 
then what I'm coming to is, I still think there is something like movement quality. In other words, if all performative arts are measured based on who is better, it is a form of quantifying performance. At the end of the day, if I have the winner or loser, then I can say one who's still standing was better than zero who's now lying on the ground, even though, of course, it, you know, it, it changes around. Something like track and field is much more about the quantifiable measures. But what I think has general value for all human beings who move in any one way is their own personal movement quality. And there I cannot get around the term movement efficiency because it means something like if we see the body as a physical system that in any given physical task conducts an amount of work, then there's a way to make that work in a more efficient way, losing less energy along the way, and in a less efficient way where I'll do some internal work. If I'm very tight, I'm getting into my own end ranges, I'm really struggling to have one of my muscle groups fight against the antagonist, and there will be a person who simply has less of these internal resistances. And that second part, that movement quality, that I think, uh, that is the part that I think all of us could benefit from, as in what is a good way of running? What is a good way of picking up an object? What is a good way of doing X, Y, and Z? And here I think the answer is A, uh, a lot less research, like we really don't yet have the knowledge, and B, variability still isn't out of the picture. We know it's not about one perfect technique of picking up an object. So it must be about a relationship that we carry within our body that I think most of us who are interested in movement can visibly see. Mm -hmm. And that's a hypothesis that I'm trying to test, hopefully over a series of studies that are you know, going to be successful either way, even if they uh, find that we might just be really biased in who we think moves beautifully and we have no clue about how to detect movement efficiency just through kinematics, through, through visual information alone. Interesting. So what I heard there was the, the, the idea of a best mover in the sense of uh, most capable of sort of solving general movement problems is not as interesting to you. Um, but you are interested in the idea of the quality that allows people to solve problems. And I think that those are more related maybe than, than you recognize. But um, so, and then you brought up this analogy of you don't want to be perfectly equally read across all scientific disciplines. Mm -hmm. This is something that I've... <clears throat> I've thought about for a long time. Like I first came into the idea of the generalist mover in relationship to CrossFit, right? Yeah. And then, uh, and then around the same time, Georges Hebert um, and uh, Method yeah. Natural, and then yeah. in discussions with Erwin Lacour as we were developing what became Movement, um, and then uh, and then Ido, right? And in all of these, there was this, especially when I was discussing with with Erwan. I remember <laughs> Erwan would say, like, basically. You know, if we had someone who could say deadlift 400 pounds, but they couldn't do a single muscle up, then we wouldn't let them train deadlifts at all. I was like, oh, but what if this guy weighs 250 pounds, right? Mm -hmm. And what if the deadlift is actually still a really effective tool to develop the type of strength that's going to translate to these other tasks that we want him to do, right? It's, it's not so simple because we're not, we're not simple archetypes. We're actually variable. And we're variable not only in um, in our physical structure, right? So we can't say, you know, the classic thing you might say is, that, okay, for to feel like an athlete is well prepared in strength, we want them to squat double body weight and bench press one and a half times body weight and deadlift two and a half times body weight. But this is an absurd standard because some people are six feet five and weigh one hundred and forty five pounds. And some people are five foot five and weigh 200 pounds. And the actual forces experienced at the levers, you know, by the muscles squatting are vastly different, are mm. completely different. And then the ability of that athlete to use whatever measured strength that they have in a barbell in, in an athletic context is also completely different. And even the optimal training angles that you're going to use are going to be potentially different because the athlete's going to have different needs based on their biomechanics and what they'd want to do. Um, and if you try to get that 
six foot six guy who weighs 145 pounds to squat double body weight and his actual mm-hmm. sport or his joy is in say dunking a basketball mm. potentially you're in order to achieve that level of strength you're going to be causing mm-hmm. negative ad- adaptations in fascicle length and panation angle and mm-hmm. structural changes to his diaphragm core that are all actually going to be... I heard com- that you've read Franz Bosch's work on the uh, <laughs> podcast with Callum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's going to be completely contrary to his performance and the thing that he actually wants. Mm. So the way that I've thought about this idea of the generalist and the specialist is not that we all want to be generalists mm. only, but that we want an appropriate level of general capacity mm-hmm. to scaffold the specific things that are of interest to us Mm-hmm. And to keep us, um, to give us sources of other sources of insight. Mm-hmm. So, it, you have a problem in scientific research of people becoming far too siloed in disciplines, and mm-hmm. they cannot make insights actually in their core discipline because they lack background information about the scientific method itself. They're they they have high hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah, right. They have high domain specific knowledge, but they don't even mm-hmm. understand the process by which that domain specific knowledge became available to them. Mm-hmm. So they can't think in general principles. They can't go to first principles, and then they can't see things that become obvious by simply having a lens that's slightly broader. And I'll give you an example. Mm-hmm. When I was a student at university, um, there. Uh, the recent African origin model of human origins had just become current because of the development of the early genetic evidence. So we had mitochondrial Eve and, uh, and Y chromosome Adam. And we said, okay, these were both African. So Mm. therefore all of our ancestry comes from Africa within the last 70,000 years. Mm -hmm. And therefore Neanderthals are a dead end, right? Everything else is a dead end. And we didn't hybridize with them. There's no evidence of, of Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA in us, so we didn't hybridize with them. And I happen to have an interest not just in hominids, but in canids. And at the time, uh, there was a huge controversies around the fact that wolves and coyotes were hybridizing. And so I started looking into the research on hybridization in animals in general, and I discovered that Hybridization is extremely common in wild populations, mm. right? Mm. Um, like basically all of the falcons or all of the falco genus falcons can hybridize in the wild. Um, mm. Coyotes, dogs, wolves, coy, golden jackals, they'll all hybridize. Uh, so you, you, this idea that it would, it would have been actually very, very strange for human beings to be separated for only 400,000 years and have developed the inability to hybridize. And also, if you know the sexual research on human beings, you know that human beings fuck chickens. <laughs> so the likelihood that we wouldn't have got it so all. So there's got to be a lot. Of, yeah. It was extremely unlikely. And so it was like, okay, cool. So you have this one source of information, genetics but you don't have a broad enough understanding of science in general to be able to contextualize the information that's coming out of that method. And so I think the same thing is true when we think about the idea of a general movement practice. If we don't have enough breadth, we will run out of our potential for creativity within a core discipline much faster. So what do you think of that as a as an argument for why movement generalism actually, ha- and, and then, sorry, I'm gonna make one more argument. Um, like looking at Franz Bosch's work, we know that movement variability mm. helps the nervous system identify that quality of movement quality that you are pointing to, right? Because it helps us identify those higher order movement parameters that allow us to control yeah. a broader set of movement dynamics. And then we can apply those in each individual task that we are, um, we're, we're oriented towards. So that was... <laughs> quite a lot Mm. go ahead and riff on that super interesting the i i'm trying to think ahead of where could this lead to Mm -hmm. um and what are the qualities that we would find are we would we be looking at something like a minimum amount of grip strength a certain amount of upper body strength a certain amount of lower body strength and flexibility 
so sort of more the general aptitudes of conditioning and your physical shape is like would that be the measure paired with a more specific competition element because where i think it gets interesting is where we start to differentiate uh, differentiate general capacity work and sport specific skill work where general capacity is essentially being removed from the or cut off from the stream of information of the spe specific problem situation that i want to solve and then i would say there's probably a lot of use to have in general good ranges of motion in general pretty solid strength and probably uh, strength in the ranges that you might be more likely to fall into if you uh, get tackled, if you stumble, all of these kind of things. If there is like a general capacity syllabus, then that's something I would say probably just useful for everyone in general. And like that's that's pretty solid. What I'm more curious about is where what is the peak or uh, I can't even say peak because that general capacity I imagine as a round orb that sits at the center of me that I can sort of um, uh, that I can outwardly grow. Mm -hmm. But the specialization component, or whenever we're speaking about movement problem solving, the currency of that is how well can I solve the problem that I want to solve. And what I'm wondering is, what is the, where, where's the road leading to that speaks of such general problem solving ability if we know from science that at least currently the thing that we haven't figured out is how to standardize the scientific method as in as standardized as it gets as saying come up with a guess or an explanation of the thing that you're trying to explain which already requires that you have a problem or an area of interest or a set of values around that like what is calling out to me oh, that's going to be the thing that i research then we're going to be looking at can i in some way test my prediction and can I do so critically so that ideally I find ways that it really shouldn't hold up but it still keeps holding up then I would find some um, something that is closer to reality there but the process can't be broken down into steps like whenever you come to your lab in the morning first touch your toes then write the first 10 sentences in your journal then you know turn around three times for good luck and then look through the microscope like there's no way of making that into a procedural syllabus so i'm wondering do you see does that model that i'm currently laying out make sense where there's like a general set of qualities let's just call them action capacities and then there's a skill specific set of qualities in my world these two i i don't yet know how they would come together unless we just decide that we have a generalist Olympic Games. And then we could test it and it would be for the fun of it, but maybe not more than that. So, I mean, have you read uh, Nikolai Bernstein's uh, On Dexterity? Not in its totality. I went through it. Okay. That's, that's a very good sort of meditation on this entire idea that we're talking about, right? And you know, basically he lays out dexterity is the capacity to solve a movement problem economically, you know, uh, rapidly and effectively, right? Mm -hmm. um, something like that. And there, there's a few other components to it. But the idea is that we actually constantly face novel movement problems. And, and essentially that's what you're doing with your acrobatic practice. Okay. Where you're, mm -hmm. what, what continues to make it interesting to you is you can go to it and you can say, here's this basic vocabulary that I've developed and I'm going to tweak this element or try to connect these elements in some way that I haven't done before. So here's a source of novelty. Mm -hmm. And then do I have the capacity to solve? Right? So you solve for it and, you know, boom, you made a solution. It felt good. It's enjoyable. And it's a source of joy. Okay. Um, so we we may not be able to measure uh, in some sense like perfectly like this is this guy's score and this is this guy's score but you can have a relative sense of how you're performing over time i can say hey okay i i i'm i'm more capable of that it's kind of like wisdom right i think of of wisdom as kind of like dexterity of the mind right I, i've i've said this to 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 um uh 
to John, right? That Nikolai Bernstein's book, I think, is actually a good a good way of starting to frame actually how we think about about uh, about wisdom as well. So we know, for instance, that intelligence alone doesn't make us adaptive problem solvers. And even rationality alone doesn't make us good problem solvers. So John's talked about the idea that uh, that wisdom is a kind of rationality applied to itself. It's like a meta rationality. So I think that we can think about like a generalized movement capacity in the same way. And the, this, this strong gap between general physical capacities and specific physical capacities, I think is less clear than, than you're, than, than perhaps you're, you're assuming it to be. So, so the, 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 the general things you could say are something like, do you have the capacity to produce enough force in your muscles to okay. solve some movement problem? So you have just general okay. muscular force capacity. So, so you have, you know, tr traditional strength, let's call it strength and then power. Do, can you produce it in enough time? Stamina. Can you produce it repeatedly? Cardiorespiratory capacity. Can you do it? Can you fuel your muscles to do it over and over and over again? Um, and then, you know, range of motion. Can you do it from, from all of these different positions. So I, I often think about like parts of my practice as attribute development. Like I'm looking for these attributes. Mm -hmm. So you could say that strength has a general, it's, it's generalizable in some sense. It's not perfectly generalizable, but it has some general capacity, right? Mm -hmm. We know that if you make a parkour athlete strong at parkour and you take him into rock climbing, that he's going to do dinos mm -hmm. well in rock climbing too. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe that there's perceptual capacities and coordinated capacities that are also generalizable. So I think part of what makes a, a parkour athlete hyper adaptive is the amount of novel perceptual information that they have to solve in reference to creating a movement solution within an environment. Mm -hmm. So can I ask, um, just because I find it such a grounding lens to mm -hmm. to look at the different models in terms of the um, explanations or the the problems that they're trying to solve and address. What problem does the general movement practice, if you have it, what is the problem that is it that it's supposed to solve? It solves the capacity to overcome novel movement problems and to adapt easily to different movement situations, right? The, my question is, do we... So I, I think it helps me if I think about specific yeah. situations. If I have a firefighter, and I'm assuming that they're going to be in a whole range of situations, they need to be generally capable. Yeah. For them, I actually, even for them, can break it down into some of the most likely scenarios that they're going to be encountering and then hope that there's going to be some variability that we bring into that so that they have the freak accident where they need to rescue an alpine skier and they need to somehow downhill ski on two feet. They haven't really practiced it, you know, whatever. Like that they can sort of do that, hopefully. But we're not going to have all our firemen be downhill skiers. Mm -hmm. But for, for the most part, we can say they need to climb themselves up somewhere. They need to be able to take a drop and jump. Uh, they need to be able to carry really heavy equipment. They need to be able to um keep their stamina while wearing heavy equipment while they're under smoke all of these things we can solve and yet i would still look at what do firefighters need to do in order to solve the problem so i'm wondering what is the person that the problem situation applies to and i want to contrast this a little bit i myself found that within the movement culture there seemed to be this uh, this sense of taking apart the person and sort of sending the person into different directions. Mm -hmm. And what I found were the most meaningful encounters is when I sat together with teachers and mentors, sometimes peers, who would help me understand what the parts of life and of movement are that are most interesting to me. Mm. And in that way, then for me personally, 
I can say because I say I have an interest in movement and physicality, I want to have something that's practical for me, that I can do anywhere, I want to do it for long term, then soft acro is sort of the result of my specific problem situation and I'm just assuming that there's more adults who want to be fit, who don't want to be doing bodybuilding, who sort of want to develop flexibility but doing it by itself seems kind of annoying or a little bit tricky to keep up. So it's like an, a motivating piece, a centerpiece where I can say, if I get myself into the acrobatic practice and framework and mindset, and I know there are really good methods of development there, then I get a lot of fulfillment for a couple of my physical problem situations through this part. And now I wouldn't say everyone has to do a soft acro, but I'm still interested in everyone who is doing acrobatics now as an adult, they will benefit from certain general qualities. What are those? And like Franz Bosch mentions, the importance of co-contractions and pre-tensioning and dynamic skills. So these are probably general principles we can then bring into the specific practice as well. But in terms of whenever I think specific movements, I'm thinking specific movement situations. Whereas Bosch's principles, that's sort of more the, the, the meta qualities that are probably going to be um, at least the way the ones that Franz Bosch researchers, they're going to, uh, they're going to apply for situations where time pressure is a problem. So anytime an athlete needs to act quickly, they need to be really good at pretensing muscles. They need to be really good at co-contractions if there's impact. They need to have a certain amount of um, both muscular and tendinous stiffness. And again, that's sort of a few principles now apply to fast situations. That's cool. What are these principles that apply for most day-to-day -day tasks? I think that's the level where I can understand the importance of knowing what is general good movement quality. But for me, that's the umbrella sort of movement efficiency. And it sounded to yeah. me more like you're laying out a framework of practice. What is that framework sure. for? So like, hmm. on the level of what it would be like to just be an adaptive movement problem solver. I think there's three fundamental relationships that you, maybe four fundamental mm -hmm. relationships. Can you move in a way that works well for your body? So it's an mm -hmm. internal relationship. Can you move effectively through the environments that are around you? Can you manipulate mm -hmm. things? And can you move effectively in relationship to another agent? That's it, mm -hmm. right? So to me, a general movement problem solver is someone who has competency across all those domains. And I think that that um, there are really fundamental ways in which those are actually sort of play out over and over and over again, right? Like you cannot be good at fighting and not be good at striking and grappling, mm -hmm. right? You cannot be good at locomotion and not be good at running, jumping, climbing, crawling, swimming. Would you say these four right. realms one should develop equally in or sort of there is a framework, there is a sort of a categorization. There have, they're different in qualities. How well I know myself is connected, but a little bit different to how well I can interact with another person and how I interact with a, an object. And I think sort of general to, education yeah. is actually mm -hmm. a, good, mm -hmm. is a good way to think about this, right? So um, if you mm -hmm. come to me and you're 10 years old, mm -hmm. how much should I be concerned about balancing your mathematics education with your, mm -hmm. with your you know, uh, grammar and logic English mm. versus your history versus et cetera. Mm. So if I'm, if I'm looking at a long-term developmental process where I do not know the end state very well, then I want to mm. make sure that we are covering the basis. Mm -hmm. As we move towards a specific outcome, then, then the need for these general things drops away. But if we drop the general things too early, we mm. very often end up, uh, tapping the developmental capacity of the athlete. And we see this with early specialization, right? We see that. But does that mean, would you, like, if you have a, a kid, uh, you do have kids, as I understand, right? Yeah. And let's say your son wasn't interested in parkour, mm -hmm. and instead he's really into playing darts. Mm -hmm. And he says, I just don't want to do parkour. Am I understanding it correctly that you would say, but it would be better for him to still do it? And if so, yeah. like, oh, for sure. what would I be mean, your... Mm -hmm. I wouldn't like, and I have said this to my kids, right? 
grappling and parkour and swimming mm. are as much part mm -hmm. of your education as math and grammar, mm. right? Mm. Because you're going to have options in the world if you can pull yourself up mm. over a wall that you don't have otherwise. Mm. And mm. I, I want you to have those options. Mm. And I think that's part of my responsibility mm. as a parent to offer those options to mm. you. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what I say is that they need to have some general locomotive practice. And a general locomotive mm -hmm. practice can be gymnastics, parkour, track and mm -hmm. field, dance, right? This is going into the realm of philosophy, essentially, right? Into the question of what should we do next, not into the question of, uh, yeah, like, yeah. it's... It... I, I, I would like to get a little bit more tight uh, kind of towards the stuff that you actually do. This has been very, very fun. <laughs> but, yeah, this is super interesting. There's like, an interesting so many bridge, different... <laughs> which is uh, you have an interesting definition of flow in acrobatics. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think there's some relationship to the, the relationship of flow that I've laid out in parkour. And I think that it actually gets at the idea of what are these kind of generalized movement capacities that are beyond something as simple as strength that we would want to have in any athlete and that can be developed as a donor in something like parkour for something that's not parkour. So can you tell me how you think about flow in, not flow as in the mental state, but flow as in a quality of movement that you're trying to achieve in your teaching and practice of uh, soft acrobatics? Mm -hmm. There are more abstract levels and then there are more specific levels that will change a bit depending on the view. But at the abstract level, essentially I want good distribution of forces. It means I want all parts of the body to participate in the movement that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I can even see on video, sometimes I'll have some internal um, information that tells me a part of my body just didn't join the movement. Mm -hmm. And in a beginner mover, often we also see parts of the body that actively interfere with the actual movement. I remember um, Callum in, I wonder if it was your episode, but he spoke about penguin hands at some point, where right? there's this pattern where some par parkour practitioners, including myself, we go sort of into this like, uh, I better want to be able to catch myself from falling. Now that's not necessarily uh, working against myself when I'm doing large stride, but it's definitely not helping me if I'm thinking of my arms as a large pendulum that I want to get the longest lever on. So on that sort of more general range, on the general capacity, I'm thinking, how can I get all parts of my body to join in the movement for the specific purpose? Now, when we think of specific purpose, it depends what the best body configurations will be if I'm looking at a front handspring or a backflip. Like mm -hmm. the role of my feet and hips is going to be completely different in both of these. Mm -hmm. And then I think we can break down every single movement in terms of the physical descriptors and i wouldn't say that's where we should teach our instructor like our students uh, i shouldn't tell my student that uh they should really try to increase their moment of inertia because they're not going to know what the freak i'm talking about language of john verveke calls this language of training versus language of description right right moment of inertia Absolutely. is not good language of training terrible language for training mm -hmm. good language though in understanding or having a model that tells me what can I expect if A happens? Mm -hmm. If I have a really large arm swing and a large wind up for a backflip, I can expect that there's a lot of torque in the system. Mm -hmm. And that torque I can then release. On the flip side, someone who by nature has this sense of reaching up instead of swinging backwards. When I teach them a backflip, I need to get some level of uh, rotational, um, uh, a rotational moment into their system, meaning I would probably teach them about spotting the target far behind their back, even though some coaches are really against that. But it would teach them by looking at a target point that I give them that they need to lean far enough back as they're doing the backflip. Mm -hmm. So then when it comes to um, sort of, that's again more a definition of uh, what makes a movement efficient. And that depends really on what the actual movement is. But I have a sense, I also, that you read a piece about flow that I'm unaware of. Can you give me a connector, how our both worlds come together? <laughs> well, I, you, you talked about flow um, in in the course that you sent me. So mm. uh, you talked about the capacity to, there's, there, you used a big word for what you were just describing, which is this kind of, uh, this, what is it? It's something like, you know, 
global intention, something like that. Oh yeah, uni global intent. <laughs> uni global intent, right? So yeah. you, you know, so that essentially, um, each aspect of the body is contributing in the appropriate way to the movement that you're doing. I think this is a good. Uh, this is a great component to think about in in skillful application of a movement. Uh, and I think that what we see with beginners is frequently that, uh, like, as you said, sometimes aspects of the body are not contributing at all. Sometimes they're actually negatively contributing, which we think about as noise, right? They're, uh, they're, they're moving in ways that actually damage the intent of the skill. Right. Mm. Um, so for instance, um, in a backflip, you know, frequently the head will move in a way that's not going to contribute to the action of the backflip because the athlete is scared, right? Mm. And it takes some confidence to to sort of even out the noise around, ah, where am I in space, right? Mm. Um, so that, that, but then you talked about this quality of, of being able to not get stuck. I think is basically what we're talking about that that flowing mm -hmm. movement has a sense of continuity mm -hmm. um and so that that was part of the model of flow that you were just describing that i that i wanted to bring in um yeah i was curious if you had any other aspects to how you think about that right and um mm. yeah, using Another way of, the core yeah. of the body versus using the extremity of the body and how that feels in um and in, in how you're organizing and able to distribute uh, motion through your system. Mm. It's another way in which I uh, segment or separate my practice, where on the one hand, I'm looking at skill development, and on the other hand, I'm looking at continuity of movement and mm. the flows that I'm practicing. And the continuity of movement, it is a different kind of practice because I want to uh, practice below far enough below my actual maximum capacities so that I have enough um, attention left so that I can reflect on the qualities reflect on my experience as I'm moving because mm -hmm. then I can get very quick feedback and I can start to make progress much faster compared to recording five backflip attempts taking a two minute break watching the video of the camera that is much uh, it's just feedback that is not direct enough to have a really steep learning curve if we do it well, if we get familiar with it, it still works. But what I love about flow is that if I practice these moves, and ideally you have a, a set of movements so that you don't get stuck after two things and you think, that was fun, I don't know what to do next, I'm going to play Mario Kart. So if you have a bit of a vocabulary, when you have that vocabulary, which could be as simple as um, going from a toe squat to placing one hand next to you to sitting down, rolling across your hip and going into a fisherman's squat, a half kneeling position. I'm just describing some simple things. It could be really as easy as sort of rolling or scooting across the floor and changing positions. Once you've got a, a, a pathway laid out for you, then you'll find that there are certain unevenness in the pathway, either when you're moving, you're doing a roll and you just feel a hard bump, a hard hit, or when you're seeing the video. And the interesting belief that I have is when I see someone on video, I'm perceiving their center of mass relatively accurately because it will show me if the entirety of the body or the masses, so the limbs as well as the center of mass as well as sometimes the head, whether or not they're showing me relatively um, uniformly accelerating motion or if there's a sudden jerk or jolt. And the sudden jerk or jolt, just like the snake that will jump out of us that will be very quickly triggered by, that sudden jolt will be very easy for us to detect. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that sort of uh, level of perception that we would have when we see someone else that we can apply to our own practice. And it's again my belief that I'll try to test and confirm or <laughs> disprove in some studies that this level of perception of continuity has to do something with movement efficiency. In other words, I'm not suddenly falling into an empty joint space where I know exactly that the force is going to get stuck in the passive tissue. If I do that often enough and it's a, not quite progressive enough, then I'm eventually more likely to injure myself. Uh, the other part, of course, is when I have my whole body in tension and I'm more, I'm distributing the tension through the muscular tension modules that essentially can connect my body then I'm assuming 
the forces in the long run will end up in tissue that is very quick to adapt. And it won't end in like an end range of motion where I'm feeling like, ah, for some reason, I feel like my uh, upper arm bone is getting jammed into um, the top of my shoulder or something like it. So that's uh, uh, basically um, sort of efficient use of the tensegrity structure, right, mm -hmm. of the body. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll give you my model. I don't know if you've heard me talk about this before, but we talk about the idea of uh, essentially, let's say five elements of flow that we have identified in parkour specifically, but I think that they're actually fairly generalizable. And what they mm -hmm. are is, and 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 this the sense of continuity, I think, is actually connected to this first element. But uh, when you reframe it as control of capacity for rhythm, it actually mm -hmm. opens up why and when statico or non-rhythmic or et cetera movement is incredibly valuable mm -hmm. right and so because in a team sport context or a, in a in an athlete versus athlete context the capacity to manipulate the sense of rhythm is one of the primary advantages that an athlete can have if i can get you to anticipate something by entraining you on a rhythm and then stop in the middle of that rhythm and go in a direction you're not expecting, that's how a crossover dribble works. That's how a juke step works. That's how a euro step works, right? So, um, you know, uh, contemporary dance, usually, but not always, has a beautiful sense of flowing, soft, um, fluid movement. But something like crump or animation is very much about the capacity to essentially stop, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. To stop momentum. And um, and you'll see that really great uh, team sport athletes have this ability to be very abrupt and sudden in acceleration and deceleration. They, they do not look necessarily, they can look very smooth, but they can also look extremely jagged when they need to. The force profiles, though, that we would pick up on uh, a force measurement plate, mm -hmm. if they're doing it well, they're necessarily very effective and very, um, uh, I want to say, kindly sloped curves. Like, they don't show uh, these extreme harsh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's wrong, right? Because what we see is it, there's a... Um, so I, I worked years ago with, or I went mm -hmm. and studied a little bit with a team called, uh, or a group called Sparta Performance Science. And they looked at force mm -hmm. profiles on, mm -hmm. uh, with six counter movement jumps or, uh, you know, mm -hmm. vertical jumps on a plate. And then they created a, a profile for the athlete. And then they looked at correlation mm -hmm. between athletic performance, uh, mm -hmm. position or, or kind of like what sport, what position and mm -hmm. uh, injury profile. So what they found is there's not a single optimal force mm. profile. So mm. basically, and then they found there's three primary variables. One variable is essentially how rapidly you can uh, increase force primarily during the eccentric. The second variable mm -hmm. is how much uh, you lose force production during amortization. And the third variable, mm -hmm. or during the, the switch from the eccentric to the concentric. And the third variable mm -hmm. is how uh, how long you can extend your force production mm -hmm. against the ground, which has to mm -hmm. do with how deep you can move and how how kind of well you can organize so you can get fully through extension before your body leaves the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so what's interesting is that some the, the optimal kind of balance between these three things is dependent on the sport. So an athlete like a cornerback in the NFL that has to, as you mentioned, is under very high time pressure mm -hmm. in every performance of movement that has to be reactive, they end up not relying on long, smooth movements very much. Instead, mm -hmm. they rely on abrupt shifting movements. So therefore, they're very good at, at stabilizing force and very good at rapidly producing force. Whereas mm -hmm. an athlete like a, uh, a pitcher or a golfer mm -hmm. or a tennis player m has a longer, more fluid arc of movement with less stabilization. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. They're really good at extending their time of force production. Mm. So if you're looking at somebody like, um, for some reason, I'm thinking of Zion Williamson, the, the, the NBA player, right? Here's a 275 pound guy who mm. can accelerate at the drop of a hat and stop mm. at the drop of a hat, which is really remarkable how, how he's able to do that. And you can see the suddenness and the capacity to shift gears quickly that he has. Um, mm. And you're going to see on a force profile that, that those first two characteristics are likely stronger in him versus that, that time of force production capacity. So I was thinking not... Um inter-individual variability, but intra or in inter-individual comparison, but intra-individual comparison. So what does a good, um, a good rapid movement look like from the person who can sustain or uh, create really high forces and mm -hmm. resist those high forces? And when they don't do their same movement quite as well, then my guess is that there'll be a, a bit too much of um, an acceleration in that curve. They'll fall a little bit too quickly into that hole so they can't get themselves out of it. So there won't be this incredibly steep peak. It will still be swift enough so that they can get out of the dip. And I don't know the literature well enough here. But Maybe what my guess is this... Mm -hmm. Sorry, well, it's an interesting question because, mm. because essentially if you think about that eccentric acceleration, Mm. Like how much can you peak that? And then obviously mm. every athlete's actually going to have a limit to where mm. if you go too fast, then they're going to lose mm. control and not be able to come out the other side effectively. Mm. But mm. so you'll see, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, uh, the capacity to do it, mm. right? the capacity to create the sudden acceleration and mm -hmm. stay organized is extraordinary. Mm valuable mm -hmm. absolutely yeah um i'm thinking about how to bridge this back to the five elements of flow that you were <laughs> mentioning earlier <laughs> okay so 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 rhythm so i said rhythm right that capacity mm -hmm. to manipulate rhythm and to move through different types of rhythmic phrasing so the mm. rhythm of running and the rhythm of a kong vault or the rhythm of a javelin throw are distinct right mm. how well can the athlete shift between these and move through the organizational principles um and then mm. the second one would be the capacity to control uh direction of inertia mm. so if you're in a cartwheel um are you falling off to one side or another can mm -hmm. you direction of inertia mm -hmm. so, so control of direction of inertia Right. And you can think about, I'm sure you can imagine this in the acrobatic context that, uh, you know, if, if you imagine an athlete who can land a corkscrew and immediately pop into a side flip, right? Mm. This athlete is controlling mm. the direction of their inertia as they're coming to the landing very well. Mm -hmm. Whereas an mm -hmm. athlete who has very few options when they land doesn't have good control of the direction of inertia. Then the next and related category would be your displacement. Can often we, uh, we're going too high or too low. Mm. So can you, do you have the sense and awareness and physical capacity to get into the optimal position in moving your, your, your center of mass up and down, mm. which is then related to this idea of, can you optimize your structural positions? So mm. can can you land with your with the right body tension and the right positioning to mm. bounce into a front flip out of a front hand sprint? Mm. That's a structural thing, right? If you don't have the right kind of organization of your structure, you're going to mm. you're, not, you're not going to be able to get the muscle synergies to make something like that happen. Mm. Um, and then the last thing is basically orientation, your ability to perceive what's happening in the environment and organize your, your, your capacity and relationship to what the affordances that are in the environment and your, the capacity of your eyes to flow through the environment, pick up information and you're sort mm. of in the right place at the right time is a, is a huge capacity that's sort of very invisible, but incredibly powerful athletically. So these all apply to being able to, to do a parkour route effectively. 
I had someone who's a basketball coach who recently reached out to me and says, I'm, I'm excited to think about this in the basketball context. And I started thinking about it. I started watching these people. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's, it's all there, right? You're locomoting yourself across the court. You're manipulating rhythm in and out. A, a, a crossover, a spin move, a, you know, whatever, that's a, that's a rhythmic element. Um, you know, do, <laughs> and there's so much that's about control of your direction of inertia and organizing your structure. If you're, if you're you know, crossing over, running down the court and having to turn and get your shoulders to the rim, if you're losing your balance in that process, you're going to be much less efficient. So, so that's how I've thought about flow in the parkour context. And that's the type of thing that I actually think is one of these other more invisible general factors that are actually relatively transferable, not completely transferable, but somewhat transferable across different athletic tasks in addition. Mm -hmm. to that. mm -hmm. That's a really interesting model that I can see if I was trying to analyze a, um, a, a speed parkour competitor. And I would try to find where are they dipping in their performance? Where are the other players, uh, the other performers better than they are? Then I could look at these qualities and see, could I find that arrow here? Mm -hmm. And then I could try to see if it's a matter of displacing my center of mass incorrectly or I'm dipping a little bit too low. What are the setups that I can create for my athlete? Uh, I'm sure Franz Bosch would be doing something about keeping a steady eye light, a steady um, sort of horizon line. Yep. Maybe I could yep, we work have a little, that. ah, that's awesome. That's really mm -hmm. interesting. So I can see how that's an interesting model and I'm curious to play around with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um, okay. So <laughs> we've already used up the time that, uh, that we wanted to use for this interview. And I think we got through one, uh, two and a half questions that I had for you and mostly got really deep into the weeds of philosophy, which is great. I loved it. Which uh, is incredibly interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's super fun for me. Um, I always said that, you know, I don't want my interviews to be just like, tell me the, the stuff that you say on every other interview. I, right. I, I want it to be like you and I are drinking beers after a training session and we're talking about our stuff, right? And if you're asking me the, the philosophy rabbit hole, I, could, yeah. I think we could go into deeper. I, it's super yeah. interesting. You've got such a broad set of ideas that are so well formulated and articulated. And I would love to uh, uh, shake and push against the walls a little <laughs> bit and, and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I enjoy that. Um, and, I, and I think that you have the type of mind and you're doing the type of education that, that makes for a really fruitful exchange. Um, so what... God. There's so much that I, we didn't get to. Um, what, I, what I really want to talk, the things I want to talk to you about are, are how you're applying motor learning specific, motor learning and understanding you know, ecological dynamics in acrobatics specifically, because I think it's actually one of the more challenging areas to think about constraints and external cues in. Um, and then how we think about skill ladders and scalers for skills in these, um, you know, unconventional things. People always say to me, you know, I could never do these kind of jumps that you do. I'd kill myself. And it's like, well, of, of course not. Right. Like you don't start there. Like everyone understands that if you see someone squat a thousand pounds, you don't just think, oh, I'd break my legs if I squatted a thousand pounds. You think, okay, well, I could start with a hundred pounds. Right. But somehow people think parkour has to start with like jumping between buildings. So what I think is really interesting about what you've done is, is how well you've articulated the, not just a scale of how you move from one acrobatic element to another, but different scalers. So I want to just at least dig into this a little bit because it's such a, a, a key thing that people need to to put on their uh, on their map. Can you tell me a little bit about how you think about the cultivation of acrobatic skill through, how to utilize different components of the skill. What are those different components of the skill and how we can progress them? Mm -hmm. The first thing that I'd love to open with, because to me, um, how deep someone is going to go into a practice has a lot to do with their interest. So if someone says, I could never do that jump, to me in part what I'm hearing is I'm not that interested in doing the jump. 
And what I would love to do is show people or speak about acrobatics in a way that they might get excited about the jump. Mm. So for me, the world of acrobatics, it boils down into six essential skills. They're not complete. They might change in the future, but there are six that are easy enough to remember where I can promise you any skill that you see in a gymnastic floor routine, in any floor acrobatic contemporary dance piece, you'll be able to point out a movement and then look at the six different skills and trace the skill tree down to an origin that you can start practicing right away. That was important for me to sort of break the initial boundaries. So just the six skills, actually, I'll just touch on it. And I would love to uh, have a little plug that you can download a sheet, a free PDF, where you can look this up in more detail. Then I don't have to sidetrack too much. The, yeah, we can throw that in the, the, the show notes. In the show notes. Perfect. If you want to download it, you can also go to softacquaron.com slash EA. Then you can just have a look. It's a sheet there. Explain it more. The six skills I call the charm skills, which is just an acronym that stands for cartwheels, handstands, aerials, rolls, macacos, and elbow levers. And they come together in such a way that you can learn how to do a windmill by combining an elbow lever with a shoulder roll. So essentially, if you've got these core pieces, and you work your way up slightly across that chain, then you can come to something like a 360 backhand spring, which you need a backwards jumping element, all the macacos, you need a twisting element that comes from some of the cartwheeling parts. And then of course, you're landing on both hands, hence then strength is going to be helpful, but dynamic cartwheels work too. So this was a big swap just to say, there is an acrobatic landscape that's easy enough for you to understand that you could start learning the cool Jackie Chan or Marvel movie skill that you just thought of. Then from there, where I think a lot of people get stuck in is, at first, they don't really know where to start. How can I do the thing now? Aaron, you just said I can learn all these skills, but realistically, what do I do? What I like to do is starting by breaking any skill down into some of the shapes that you see. Because by definition, if you can't get into the shape in some way or another, then you can't do the skill. But you don't have to do the full skill to test what you're feeling around the shapes is. And that would be a way of saying we're um, segmenting the skill. It's not a way that you're going to learn the skill, but it's giving you some information. It's like reading a map for the first time. We're not confusing the map with the territory, but it's a piece where you can pick up initial information. For example, you might find out that, huh, when I put my feet on a couch and I put one hand down on the ground and I shift my weight over one shoulder, I can actually bear some weight over that shoulder. That's an essential piece for doing a macaco. If you turn in a little bit, it becomes more of a cartwheel thing. But you don't have to do the cartwheel or the macaco that feels risky before getting a sense for the territory. So start there with the roots. From there on, the other part that I like to say is track your data. And data is just the four different parts. I reformulated a little bit recently to make it more generally applicable for all acrobatic skills, where D stands for the distance of a skill that you can track. And a distance could be a distance between two points on the floor that you jump across, or it could be the distance between two body parts. And there's some relation in the skill. For example, if you're practicing a cartwheel and you want to do an aerial, the distance between your hands on the ground will make the skill harder or easier, or will make it closer to an aerial, a shorter cartwheel, or will make it more like a one arm large transition. So in other words, just by manipulating that part, the distance between two points, you now start to have a very fluid scale for making a skill more or less difficult. And that's what I'm saying is exists in acrobatic training, just like it exists in weightlifting. If you are putting a bar on your back and it's getting heavy, then you're putting just a pound on the bar and try to lift it again next week. And that same logic can apply for acrobatic learning. Now for the data acronym, the other acronyms are, or the other parts are, you can change a distance, you can change an angle in general, which has to do more with inversion, uh, with level of inversion or how horizontally you're oriented. It also can be the angle between the arms. Um, then you can change the timing. And in part that can be how quickly you do the movement in general. Uh, time pressure will always make the skill harder, uh, will always put more pressure on you as the performer. But you can also change the timing between limbs or between the point where you feel like I'm strongly pushing the ground away and I'm looking towards my target point. Maybe they change an angle. Maybe it does a difference for you. And then the last part is the level of assistance that you use. And you could use external assistance, which I generally advise against as another person, because then you also need to learn how to rely on the person properly. Mm -hmm. If what you want to do is do acrobatic skills safely by yourself. Like the pole dancers have something they call spotter syndrome, where they can perfectly do the skill when the spotter is there, but they can't do it at home anymore. 
And yeah. what I'm saying is we don't need to develop this dependence. Now, the real meaningful part out of these four data measures comes that there's not one prescriptor that says, this is how you have to progress the skill. That's one of the biggest mistakes when I see other coaches coach acrobatics, when they propose the way for moving forward. They're saying, oh, no, no, you're doing this wrong. Do that instead. And that, as we know, because movement is a complex thing, there's so many degrees of freedom. The question is, how do you, the performer, solve the problem in the best way? And the answer is probably the coach can't give you the exact next step that you need to take right now, or not need, but that would be the easiest step for you to take. And the interesting thing is sometimes the detour is the fast route to get to your skill. If you're trying to force something very cognitively, your coach says you're not allowed to flick your neck back too much, then that might just not be a thing that allows you to backflip for years on end, where what you would have needed instead is just change a different one of these trackable measures, change a different constraint. And if you find yourself literally in any skill and you're in a root shape, you're just in some acrobatic shape, you can start to think, what is a small hop, a small jump, a small weight shift that I could do? And how could I scale that weight shift, up, uh, weight shift up in any direction? Now, it's not promised that you will immediately get better, but by exploring the search space, the promise is much higher that you lead to success. And what these four little markers give you is um, four different search lights that send you in different directions. And by the nature of that, by actually trying a lot of them out, not by saying, I always track my angles, that's why I'm great at acrobatics, but rather by saying, I'm good at exploring the acrobatic landscape, that's what will actually make you learn acrobatics quicker. That's great. Um, I want to just briefly explore a couple stories of my kids learning, and um, and then we can explore how that, uh, how you then work as a coach with these pieces. So... Um, uh, my son, uh, when he was, he learned to do a front flip on a trampoline, I think when he was five or six. And then when he was six or seven, uh, he had an older boy who he learned to do their front flips with. And that older boy was coming to visit and he decided before that boy arrived, he had to learn a back flip. He just decided he had to learn a back flip. So I think he was still six years old at the time. And so we went out on our backyard trampoline. And he independently with basically no instruction from me started doing backdrops and rolling over onto his feet. And he did this a bunch. And then he just basically looked sideways. So he got earlier information and he cheated his angle and he landed on his knees. And then he did that for a while. And then he started landing on his feet. And then he adjusted his head position and went directly over. So that he, he had a backflip within 45 minutes when he was six years old. And uh, that's a phenomenal beginner's course on how to actually learn a backflip. <laughs> yeah. And so I've actually taken that progression that I learned from watching him and worked with multiple adults and, and gone through it with them. Now, my, uh, my daughter recently decided that she wanted to do a backflip. And so she's gone through the backdrop and bounced back to her feet. She has great air form. She has great tuck. She has great awareness coming to her feet. But the idea of jumping backwards and releasing and trusting herself to come over to her feet, she can't do. It's too scary for her. So she asked me, she basically asked me to, to help her. And I was like, well, let's go back and learn the makaku. We, we had learned that a little bit before, but she kind of went away from it. So was like, let's, let's go up from there. But she started to feel really embarrassed and she started to feel like mm. now you're asking me to go do kid stuff. Mm. Right. So I ended up spotting her and <laughs> spraying my finger really badly. But, uh, but you know, she, she was able to do it with a spot. And then by the way, my son, he ends up he, he does the standing backflip then. And then one day he's dancing to footloose and just does a backflip, <laughs> lands on it. Oh, and wicked. On one knee. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, uh, and then it's, it's been hit or miss from there. But, but sometimes when we take an athlete back and look at an alternative scale up, right? So, the, so, so the, the backdrop on the trampoline is one ladder to the skill. Then we get to standing on the trampoline mm. and then we can maybe work on a 
you know, if we had access to it, we could have a less bouncy trampoline or we could have an air trick. I tried to, I tried to take my son to flip back flipping off a platform. And that was, that was scary for him. He didn't like that. Mm. Mm. Um, and you know, so there's, there's various ways to get there, but one of the ways that was going back to the makaku and making mm -hmm. sure that there was lots of comfort in various ways of mm -hmm. inverting over the head backwards and feeling like mm -hmm. you're aware of where you are. But what I ran into is there's a motivational problem with my yeah. daughter. She's 11 years old and she feels like she's being asked to regress and it makes her feel embarrassed. So I'm curious, mm -hmm. just from a coaching perspective, how you set up these platforms and then how you work with the motivational frame with your, with your students. Mm, super important. This understanding that all learning paths will, at the end of the day, depend on the learner much, much, much more than they depend on the coach. Mm -hmm. And I think what a good coach can is think alongside the learner of possible pathways. And instead of telling them the pathway that they should go, finding a way to articulate them so well that the person at the end of the day decides to take their own step in a direction. What I found works really well with kids is having physical things like any performer essentially who if they feel like they have to fulfill an external shape or form that they could not do well but they don't even know if they do it well that they tend to not like as much. But if I, they can give them an external focus and I don't tell them anything about the form or the shape or this little regression that we're doing then they're much more engaged. So in other words, if you have a pool noodle and you have a target to jump at, chances are your daughter would have liked to find different ways of jumping over the pool noodle. If she is, if she likes catching objects and not all people do, then it's possible to throw something at her and have her catch the ball with one hand. And it could be possible that you then say, your feet are, uh, you have a, uh, lava under your feet is you know not a great example but like some find some image in which she cannot use her feet and instead have to land on her knees now if you have that garden trampoline you have her jump over something in a certain orientation and have her land on her knees she's going to do a tuck eventually so essentially i want to disguise the technique as much as possible in any sort of externalizable game and then that's very important that we know. My goal is not to have a perform the thing at the end, because that's what I want to do as a coach. And it's a nice testimonial if I'm getting paid for it <laughs> or if I can show it to my friends. But what I want is that she had a fun learning session where she had loads of variability and she wants to come back. Because when I've got that, she had fun. At the end of the day, she forgot about the backflip or, or she remembered the backflip midway through. That also happens, especially with kids when they're like, okay, now I'm ready to try again. <laughs> and suddenly like they found some courage somewhere. Um, but then I fulfilled my role as a learning coach. Now the performance outcome might have not been there at all. But what we're looking at as the learning coach is that she is, whenever she feels like she wants to do a uh, skill on the trampoline next, she's got this repertoire of things. And even if there's not someone holding the pool noodle, she now remembers, ah, there was this cool pool noodle jump. I can just imagine there's a noodle. And then when she wants to go back, then she'll go back. But it takes this certain level of, I as a coach almost has to have to assume that the person I'm working with, they're not really interested in learning the skill, but they might be interested in something that neither them nor I have discovered yet. And what I want to find is a framework in which they can make the discovery on their own. And that's when I feel like learning often just feels rewarding because neither one of us is trying to push for a, an outcome. Both of us are trying to find fun learning pathways. Mm -hmm. Did that, did that give some context? I think that's great. Uh, I think that's brilliant. Um, I think that, that, that search for joy and like working, I, you know, another thing we could talk about is the idea of athlete autonomy and authenticity and how we uh, produce practice design. Um, and yeah, I highly appreciate those suggestions. I'm kind of, I was, I was thinking of ways to apply them today. Um, I'm going to be working with two of my kids today at, uh, in the wow, that's awesome. So it's going to be a fun time. Um, I feel like I need to let you go. I'm, I've run you uh, a, a half an hour past uh, the time we had scheduled today. Um, I, I really enjoyed discussing the meta sort of pedagogical principles of you know what this whole thing is about. Um, but I feel like there's a lot more that you have to give on, 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 on a really kind of a little bit more specific pedagogical level. 
about how you've thought about that, how you're applying and, and the work that you're doing both academically and in your practice. So I'd love to have you back to talk a little bit deeper about motor learning and how we approach specifically acrobatic skills and how we build these skill letters. Um, cause I think that, uh, there's just a lot more that you have to offer people there. And, um, and it'd be good to, 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 to talk about that. So if folks would like to start learning from you right now, though, um, what do you, uh, what have you have? And do you have anything interesting coming up that people should know about? Absolutely. The best way to just get a quick overview is on Instagram, Soft Acro Aaron. That's my handle. Um, like soft and acrobatics, but acro and Aaron with double A. There, I really recommend to just look around a little bit on the thumbnails. I'm bringing up my YouTube channel. I have a bunch of free stuff that you can just find at the link in my bio as well. I have a set of courses, but I really recommend checking out the free stuff first because you'll know if you vibe with me or not. Um, and besides that, I got to say, Rafe, you're like a big inspiration in this wider movement context, in this wider movement field, because you're so not only well-read and researched, but also as a teacher and as a practitioner yourself, you've got this just knowledge base where I feel like you do have 10 years and more on me in several areas that I'm, I just feel really fortunate to be able to be in touch with you and to jam with you a little bit. So thank you so, so much for your invitation and for your playfulness. Awesome. Yeah, I really enjoyed jamming with you and I look forward to our next chance and uh, hopefully we'll get some uh, soft acro in the trees going here uh, sometime soon. That'd be amazing. <laughs> we'll make it happen one day. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.